I've been told by everybody up on this roof that they're all off the roof. I am on the roof of exposure four. Got fire through the roof of the fire building in the entire rear section. Now remember, give us a payday. As you've been accounted for, okay? 610B, that was the main date, 610B. I'm out here, we got a fire. One and a half story, single family dwelling, fire shown from the second floor, give me a second alarm on this. See up there, top floor, I got people hanging out the top floor windows with a baby. Commercial building, uh, a lot of fire, a lot of smoke, go ahead and strike a third alarm on my orders on this. We got people on the front fire escape here with windows fences below them, we need somebody up there. Yeah, let them know we got a job. I'm pulling up now. Second alarm, I got a one-story single-family frame. Heavy fire showing from the attic. So we're using all hands. We got one line stretched, fire on the fourth floor. Second line being stretched. Primary searches are underway. Hey, welcome back to our Fire Engineering Podcast at Command Post. I'm Chief Rick Lasky, along with my best buddy, Chief John Salka. Um, and we've got a topic for you today. Actually, we'll get to it in a second. That was suggested by one of our listeners, which is pretty cool. We're always, we, we can't always get to all of them. And some of them we've actually done before, but uh, uh, we've talked briefly about this particular topic before, but we're going to just focus this, this particular show on it. Um, John, uh, you, you've been busy um, jumping all over the place and uh, obviously doing a bunch of different uh, programs and conferences, but I think the biggest news lately is you're you're a grandpa again, man. You're a grandpa. Again, again, number three, the second boy, the third grandbaby. Maureen had Mateo, seven pounds, one ounce, about three weeks ago now, or two and a half or whatever. I'm already in trouble for not remembering. But <laughs> what a beautiful uh, baby. Oh, he is beautiful. And not only is he beautiful, more importantly, he is good. He's not a crier. <laughs> he's not a fusser. He eats and drinks and shits and goes to sleep. You know, it's like uh, it's very nice. So she's very happy with that. It could it, you know, we know people that have had babies that are a little bit more active, a little bit more noisy, and there's nothing wrong with having a quiet one, you know? You know, and I told Maureen, I forget whether we were at your house or we were out somewhere. Um, you know, all your kids are great, you know, and um, but I told her once, I said, you're going to be an incredible mommy. I mean, she, I watch her with Colleen. I watch her just, you know what I'm saying? She, I just, I was She's like, you know, yep. I mean, yep. but I, but I also, I watch Brian and, 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 and Rachel and then, and then Johnny, I'm sure I've I just, and, and your daughter and her baby. I mean, she's, I see her on Facebook. I'm watching her for the last, how long now? My God, she's, just, she just sprouted up. She oh. looks like a, she looks like a four-year-old, you know? Oh, I mean, and I, I, and, well, Travis is six, nine, so she's going to, we already know she's going to be tall, but she's just she i love her so much she makes my heart hurt and you know we're all and we, we've said it before you and i that the, the greatest bosses we know the greatest leaders we know um they value family and even someone like patty brown who didn't have like you know his family was the fire service and his best friends around him you know i guess it's the people that cherish family and friendship that's it i've never seen a great leader john a great boss do well right that, that was a loner so, right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it, it it did work that way. So, hey, we've been doing to our, for for our, for listeners, we've been doing some great hump day hangouts. Uh, you can catch them right here on fireengineering.com. Um, you know that they're they're on Wednesday, obviously. Uh, John and I and, and and our buddy Terry McGrath. Uh, Terry's our our my, my, actually my co-host and um, uh, assistant chief of Louisville. Terry's great, and Chief Scott Thompson from the county, and obviously the boss, Chief Bobby Halton. And we we've had some great conversations with that. That's some great topics, but uh, and uh, as always, we always mention we have some great seminars and great classes coming up. So just uh, get with us. Uh, I've said this umpteen times before. Um, I post all the classes that I do, but I especially post all the classes that John and I do together. So a lot of the company officer academies and battalion schools and all their different stuff are posted and the information on how to sign up and everything else. So all you got to do is is check that out. So and if you're looking to host anything, give us a shout, man. We'll. We'll see what we can do. The, the calendar kind of is gone, but uh, we'll, we'll, we can make it happen. But so, John, so uh, Tim, and I think it's Tim, uh, I, I want to say Gravius, G-R-A-V-I-U-S. So sorry, Tim, if I pronounced it wrong. But uh, Tim sent us a nice, nice email, buddy. We get we get a lot of these and we're honored uh, about attic fires, about attic fires. And I know you and I have touched on it before and on, 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 you know, this podcast, on old school, on some of our hump days, but uh, I don't think we've done, devoted a show, you know, totally to addressing attic fires and, and all the different as things. Single, as a single topic, yeah, right? Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think we have. We've touched on it, right? Well, and you and I have talked about this a bunch of time in our tactics and strategy classes, and, and I'm very outspoken about, you know, 
some people don't like basement fires. I think those are, I think at times those are like the ultimate challenge. If you're going to go down, you got to beat your way down to hell to get down there. You got to know how to do it. Some good high rise fires are good, you know, getting in there and, you know, get, getting down and dirty. Um, I hate, I'll just, I'll be honest with you. I hate attic fires. And the reason I hate them is because they're a pain in the ass because w- once you get them knocked, the rekindle issue, all the blown in insulation, all the crap, I'd rather get a room and contents, you know, after the EDUs are done, right? The, 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 we, I know you'll like this one. One of my investigators at Louisville used to come out and say, okay, chief, you can send in the EDUs. And he was one of our investigators, Kenny. And he EDUs was an acronym for evidence, evidence destruction units. That's what he called the truck guys. You can send in the, the evidence destruction unit, the, the EDUs. But even that, I mean, they just, you know, you get a room of contents, you can scrape it, throw it out, you're done, and you rarely have to go back. But golly, man, I, I just, that's what got us to do that rekindle policy to lose so much is I just, you think you got it, you go back. Thermal imagers don't always see what you need to see. You really have to overhaul, overhaul. But there's so many other things, John, when it comes to addressing an attic fire, um, you know, building construction and a whole bunch of different things. So, let me throw it to you. I know I've got a bunch of thoughts. You and I never write shit down, so we just fly. But your thought on addressing, let's talk attic fires. So what first comes to your mind? Well, I, I think one of the most interesting and maybe challenging as well issues with attic fires is you really don't know. Now, it sounds silly when you say you don't know where it started, but like it does, not that it doesn't matter where a bedroom fire starts or a kitchen fire starts. You have a kitchen fire on the first floor of a house. You have a kitchen fire. Like it probably didn't start at the basement and spread up to the kitchen. You have a bedroom fire on the second floor of a house or the first floor. It probably room and contents, probably. But when you when you have an attic fire, and again, depending on the type of building and stuff, it could have started in the mulch in the front of the building from a cigarette, and ran raced up. up the outside flammable siding, jumped into one of the eaves, and you got an attic fire, right? Or... Or it could be a Queen Anne or a building that has balloon construction, and you might have had a basement fire or something in the walls that traveled up, skipped the second floor, jumped into the attic. Or you just might have an attic fire. The kids might have a room up there, or it might have been a short. Somebody might use it for storage and plop a big box on top of a wire for the well, lights below. There's a, so many ways you can have a, an attic fire. So let's back up to one of them, because if we, if we date ourselves building construction-wise, you know, if we go back in time, we're looking at older the older construction, the ordinary constructed, or the balloon frame, you know, the, the, the wood frame buildings of old. You know, we talk about balloon frame and some of the ways to identify them with windows lining up and different stuff and so on and so forth. But a lot of our young firefighters, John, they deal with all the new stuff and, and frame. And God bless them. But when you try to explain a balloon frame that, you know what, like the house I grew up in, I could go drop a tennis ball in the attic down one of the walls and if it doesn't hit a pipe it goes all the way into the basement from one end to the other and guys get all hoodooed about those those kinds of fires and i'm like the only thing you really need to know is how the fire can travel it's dimensional it's a, it's a good strong building it ain't gonna you know you gotta burn the you know what out of it to get to be a you know a, i mean it, i've always thought you had time plus most of the walls that's been remodeled are wire plash lath or wood lath or you got some time but Right. The fire spread, the fire travel is, is in my world, I, it's always been is the biggest concern, how it's running. Like you said, right? How What do we always talked about? You pull up and you got a balloon frame constructed home and you have a fire in the cellar, fire in the basement, dryer, wash, whatever. The first line goes to the basement, the second fly, line goes oop, all well, the way up. I mean, it, it probably does go up. I certainly sent some folks up there. I sent some people up there, a truck or a search team or something real quick too. But the chances of it being there are so good that you'd probably yeah. you'd probably run in a lineup there too. The the other issue with the outside fire, like like that that mulch fire or that bush or fireworks or whatever it is, you know, the outside, frankly, it could be another thing, another thing. I mean, let's let's count the variables. We're up to three or four already. So you get a small room fire downstairs, it vents out the window, burns up the outside of the building. It's almost just like balloon frame. Even though the house isn't balloon frame, it takes the same route. It's going to go right up the outside. If you got, you know, flammable siding, catch under that eave at the top, and either you'll have an attic or a crawl space fire up there. So the point is you pull up to a fire that looks pretty dramatic from the front of the house. Holy cow, the whole side of the house on fire. You knock it down, and then you go start checking the rooms. You, you better get somebody up, upstairs to the top real quick, too, because if there's any eaves at all, and I haven't seen a house that didn't have some, some kind of eaves, whether they were deep eaves or not, uh, the chances of having an interior fire as a result of that exterior fire are gigantic. And some people, 
just don't have the training or the wherewithal to think about that until somebody goes upstairs and says, hey, we got a fire inside, you know? Well, and that, yeah, that's that's the thing. Like I said, a lot of guys get caught where they focus on getting out of the cellar, getting out of the basement. And I'm like, we need someone upstairs. And, and uh, our rule was, you know what? If it's if you if you're taking a line to the cellar to the basement, the second line is going to the attic because I mean, yeah, it can make a right hand Clyde, you know, if it will, right hand turn and run, you know, because it hit some pipe or whatever. But chances are, if it's going to run at all, it's going to be up in the attic. And like you said, if we're not paying attention to that, you're like, oh, everything's fine. And you're like, but what's that coming out the top? And, and, and you know, the indicators for like that was always you pull up and you got smoke pushing out like the cracks and around the wood and around windowsills and right. come pushing right. stuff. I mean, you but, mentioned basement fire versus attic fire and, you know, you, you, you obviously said the attic fire was the one that was more either challenging or difficult or Pain whatever. Yes. And, and I'm the other way around. I'm the other way around. I mean, I'm not going to go find a find an attic fire with a bathing suit on or anything, but 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 a basement fire to me seems more challenging. And I I I just think of it as, you know, if the shit hits the fan, if you do it right, just like anything else, it's probably not going to be a big deal if you get down them stairs quick and and get water going. But if you don't, or if things go bad, or if there's some half ass, you know, compartmentation oh. down there or whatever. Climbing back up the stairs through the chimney is a lot harder than just tumbling down the stairs. Right, out of right. And, and my, my, yeah, my exact point was, and there's no windows in the basement. Yes. I love the channel. I, I, I've said before, I think one of the most challenging fires is the basement fire, having to beat your way down to hell. The reason I say I hate the attic fires, John, when I say they're a pain in the ass, you can get up there and you can knock it. But because of the ease, because of all the crap, because of the things overhauling is always if you if we're going to be back there for a rekindle, it's not necessarily going to be in a basement or in a room in contents. It's going to be up in the attic because of all that crap on the side or whatever. Right. But and if it's unfinished, then you got all the braces and the supports and the collar beams and stuff, and you're banging your damn head on everything. At least down in the basement, for the most part. If it's even even if there's junk down there in piles, even if it's not really compartmented, if it's not finished, it's still sort of normal height. That the the heat's going to lift off you a little bit once you're on the floor up in the attic. You know, you, you like I said, you're banging into the slopes of the of the uh, of the peak roof. You're hitting the damn collar beams across up up there at the top of the peak, and the heat's not going anywhere. Even if they have a hole, it, you, you know, you're right in the you're well, right in the heat area. And you just said the hole. The hole's not designed for firefighters Ricky Lasky and Johnny Salka to climb up through this little thing with gear and an SCBA on and everything else. I and mean, nine times out of ten, it's not. It's not designed for us to climb up in there unless there's a staircase leading up to finish or unfinished attic, that kind of thing. So you've got that. So we talked about, and I, I'm glad you brought the mulch stuff. God, I've been so many times guys like, you know, how'd the fire get here? And they, and I'm like, we're raking mulch up next to a McDonald's, like 20 I feet away. Realized, I never Burns realized underneath. how flammable oh. and fast mulch really got going. It gets crazy. And then and underneath, cause they keep putting it on top. So you get it burning. You don't even know where it's at. You got to rake the whole stuff up. But then, so you've got the guy, people outside there doing stuff. They're 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 barbecuing, and it gets going up the wall. We have plumbers that are are, are sweating pipes. It gets going up the wall. Our best Luckily, customers, plumbers. Yep. <laughs> Thanks for the work. I was having fun with the young guy in class this weekend in in, in Oxford, uh, Maine, and uh, we were doing that. But uh, but so you've got that. You've got electrical, pro- all kinds of problems that could create and get something going in the attic. Okay. So and another thing we talked about. You said fireworks. People forget about that. You know, you get these guys who are launching bottle rockets or to- Roman can- and they roll down your the person's roof into their gutter. And if they didn't clean their gutter out there, you know, they got all the leaves in there. That starts going and it burns perfectly right back up into the attic. I died in Buffalo. I went to the funeral. It was one of Mike, one of Mike Lombardo's guys died in Buffalo. It was uh, around 4th of July, I guess. It didn't matter what day it is, but it was that time of year when everybody's shooting fireworks off. Apparently somebody shot a couple of bottle rockets off or whatever. And hit the roof, rolled down the roof, landed in a gutter, gutters full of leaves, and got going. Now, they called the fire department because they looked up. It was like a two and a half story, you know, peak roof private dwelling. No fire escapes. Nobody's going to go run, get a ladder, and try and get up there. They called the fire department. Hey, uh, you know, and when, and when they pulled up the companies, the story is they looked up and, and yeah, there was some flames visible in the gutter, you know, and they, they started to put the ladder up and stretch a line. And they sent a couple of guys up the interior to the attic. And they got up there and, you know, pulled down the whatever it was, a staircase or whatever, and went up in there. And suddenly conditions changed. Suddenly it got hot real fast, real smoky, real hot. Those two guys started to, you know, try to haste makes waste and get out of there. And one of them didn't. It flashed over and actually killed a Buffalo firefighter, an attic fire from a firework, you know, from a bottle rocket in the dang, you know, gutter with leaves. Killed a firefighter. Yep. 
Well, and again, you know, when you're, we always talk about complacency is a fancy word for laziness. When you're complacent, you're not paying attention. Not that not they were. The, we're not saying no, 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 were. no, 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 we're not. But I'm just saying as a whole, when, when you're trying to run it by yourself as a boss, or you're sitting in a car down the block and you don't have people in front, people in back people, you know, some of these guys, they used to say when I first got the Lewis, well, why are we bringing all these chiefs? And I used to say, because I care about you. They, look, you know how to do your job. They're standing there going, that don't look good. This look, or whatever. You know, having those bosses that are there to take a look. I wasn't saying they were complacent. I'm saying. No, no, no. And, and that brings up another topic, you know, but but it's related. Like you just said, and, and it just seems like everything we talk about eventually one way or another comes back to bosses and leadership and offices. Uh, and yeah. like this too. So here they are, you know, forget the Buffalo job. An engine and truck pull up somewhere on the 4th of July and they got to reduce response because they're so busy. And again, uh, you know, latitude, a battalion one, go ahead. Yeah, it looks like we get some fireworks in the uh, gutter on the second floor. I'm going to go check it out. 10 fall latitude. You know, some chiefs will sit in the car then and look at the, and, and, and look at the radio, not the radio, the screen, or look at the clipboard and see where they're going next and say, how's it going? You find it yet? And sort of like, and sort of like blow it off. Maybe not even get out of the car and say, oh, yeah, oh, it's that house right there. You have that little bit of smoke coming off. Instead, bosses that you had, bosses that I had, would unass the rig, walk down there, stand in front of the building with their hand on their radio, and just like they did the night before when it was fire out three windows. They do the same thing every time because that's what you get paid for, and you got to pay attention. And everybody knows somebody could get killed at a fire with his window, fire out three windows. But what about that fire where there's just a little a little two foot stretch of leaves burning in, in a gutter? And, and and oh, I forgot to mention, and the people were on the front porch, you know, drinking beers and smoking cigarettes when the fireman pulled up because it didn't look like a fatal fire. It didn't look like a job. Right. It looked like, hey, brothers, yeah, it's up there. You know, you want a beer, you know, and I'm not knocking those people either. It looked even to the people whose house it involved like it wasn't a big deal. But everything's a big deal when you go on a run and every officer should be treating every single run like it's a big deal until you're driving away from the place and you know from a good report or from a personal inspection that things are okay. Well, you know, our friend Don Abbott does the Project May Day and you and I, you know, we love it because he gave us the data, gave us the, the 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 facts behind what we've been arguing about, like not using lunar change. Of oh, we built part. a couple of programs on his information. Oh, that exactly. Program. And that whole, the, you know, the 15, uh, you know, the, the, the trigger phrases you hear before Maydays, after 12,000 Maydays, this is what they heard the most right before the Mayday. You know what, another one, you know, this is another phrase that bothers me lately. And, and I think you and I have talked about this several times. This is the phrase that bothers me coming out of a chief's mouth, B BC or whatever. When he's talking to whoever's up at, at the fire, I've heard this so many times. Uh, okay, can you tell me about, about, about what's this? Yeah, this, I don't have eyes on the fire yet. I don't have eyes on the building yet. I don't have, I hear that. That's like a very common phrase all of a sudden. Yeah, you know, engine five, you know, do you have any electric? I heard this one. I told you about this one, double fatality, and they blew it. It took them 20 minutes to search. I don't have I don't have eyes. I don't have eyes in the building. Do you, you know, do you have a lot of fire at the front? I don't have eyes in the building yet. I'm not down there. You know, do you have any electrical hazards? And I'm going, as much as you've been, I don't have eyes. You could have got your ass out and walked down there. Look, you know, I know some places the bosses are regiment about you will have to sit in the car. Well, you know what? Then get someone else in front. You know, and I'll be honest with you. Bruno, Another just, negative to that ridiculous policy. You know, you know, the, I, I remember, and I'll remember this, a lot of guys used to, you know, blame Bruno for, they used to remember half of his phrase. He used to say, you can run a fire sitting in a van all the way down to City Hall. But he used to say, but he followed up, I go, but you still need somebody in front. <laughs> Feed that, you can't just go, well, we're in Connecticut right now. It looks like they have a good job over in Boston. You have to have people in front of the building. And I'm a big one, John. The cover and contain that Eddie Enright taught me. Boss is in the front, boss is in the back. I got one in safety, put one on the floor, whatever. But that's how you miss these things with, with, with the gutters and stuff like that. So let, let's get back to another this. Issue, another phrase I hate hearing on the radio, and it's related to, you know, attic fires is, it doesn't look like much. It doesn't yeah. look like much. But you know what? I don't care what it really looks like. I want to find out what it is, where it is, and handle it, and then and then we'll be out of here. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't look like much. That sounds crazy to me, you know? It doesn't look like much. I don't have eyes in the building. And our famous, our, one of our absolute favorites that we love, nothing showing. So that, <laughs> nothing showing we'll a crappy size. Yeah. So so we, 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 we briefly mentioned the different types of construction, you know, whether, I mean, with attics, there's, there's attics on everything. And, and, you know, we're, we're, we're talking attic fires, not necessarily a cock law fire. There is a, a difference, you know, we're talking 
attic fires. Um, you know, the, the different types, I think, of buildings, John, like we said, and construction are going to affect what you have. But once it gets in the attic, it's in the attic. It becomes an accessibility problem. If you don't bring the right tools, if you carry the little five-foot Fisher-Price closet toy pike poles, you know, unless you're unless you're six nine, you're gonna be pulling crap on your head. You're not gonna be you're not you know you're gonna wear yourself out instead of bringing the right tool to the job and just reaching up and pulling ceiling, knowing how to pull you know wood plaster lap or wire lap or ship lap and how to you know having the right like those those all purpose hooks the FDM all purpose hook John and the the Halligan hook oh my God, you know what if you know how to use that ain't nothing keeping you out of an attic. I don't care ship lap or not right. that stuff, you know, if you know how to use that. So the ceilings are going to affect, you know, what we do in a way of accessibility. Then what do we because, have? Because sometimes obviously there's different, there's different configurations in an attic. Some attics, the sloped peak goes from the peak at the top all the way down and, and touches the floor. In right. which case it's, it's neither the wall nor the ceiling. It's both. Now, some places you go up there and there actually is a knee wall. A knee wall. And if there's heavy smoke, you could get up there and all of a sudden you're going to hit a vertical wall. It's 90 mm -hmm. degrees to the floor. And then it's going to hit the ceiling, which is really the angled roof. And then it's going to continue up a little bit better. As that's where as I used to hide. And maneuverability. That's where I hid. Up in my bedroom, I had knee walls. And there was little there, there was there was dresser drawers built into the one side, John. It was kind of cool. They built them into the one side. But there, were, you could get in behind her. I could get into my knee walls. That's why I played. I played absolutely. With my toys. I had the same thing in my bedroom at yeah. home. Yeah. But how many firefighters have been jammed up? Our good friend Larry McCormick from Chicago, and he was on the squat. Remember, he made that rescue. That firefighter, that probe on a nozzle. You know, the captain came down. You know, it lit up. They were they were in the process of backing them out to to put the snorkel to work. Just it was with a bungalow, Chicago bungalow, same roof that you're talking about. Coming down, then it drops down. You have the knee walls. And they're they're backing everybody out. They're going to give it a give it a good shot with the bucket from the front, and then go back after it. Captain comes down, and says, "My probie, my probie." He got you know he lost the line. They got separated. Remember, Larry goes up and and ends up dragging this guy out on fire with Larry on fire, saves his life. But that was a knee wall problem. That was a fire that got into the knee walls and got behind him. So just like guys don't pay attention to the simple thing that could be going on with a gutter or whatever, you know, or in a balloon frame being in, a, in the cell of the basement, I'm paying attention to the attic. The same thing with the knee walls. It could sneak right behind you. It could run right alongside you and get behind you, and you don't even know it. Well, it, not only that, but when you get up to the attic for this attic fire, or you go up to check the attic for the basement fire or all the other variables, when you get up there, you might like, yeah, we got fire up here. I can, you know, it's, we got high heat, dense smoke. You might not see anything. The, the, the knee wall on one or both sides might be, concealing fire in that in that crawl space let's right. call it right and the fire is going to be going over your head we're talking now assuming this is a finished attic so you got a floor you could even have furniture up there maybe a room like my bedroom was up there so you got those finished knee walls then you get the finished angled ceiling that goes up to a peak or sometimes they even drop it down to a little flat ceiling there right you could have attic in the in the crawl space in the angled roof section and all the way up to the top, to the peak, all the way around you. You could have fire all the way around you and not have any visible fire. So, so they are up there in an attic with, you know, completely surrounded by fire. Now, it, I'm not saying it could or couldn't or wouldn't. If you have a window and it's vented or not vented, if, some, if, if somebody opens a wall, meaning with a tool, or opens a door, there's almost certainly some kind of a little access door into those, into those crawl spaces like you had and like I had. You can have the right mix. You can get a quick flash there. You can, you can burn somebody we, up. We've had, one of us I, up. A good friend of ours got burned. His whole back is scarred to this day because he caught a flash over an attic. So, you know, and having been a roofer as long as I was, you know, I, I, as long as I did that, I, I know who did good and who did do good with whether it was two roofs, three, uh, some of the peaker ones in the old days with four or five layers of roofs, no vents in the old buildings versus these little tin, you know, the tin, you know, the tin roof vents and the other ones to, ridge vents now that are open up the whole top of it's open up and give me a chance you know down low if there are finished eaves having those vents you, you you know the whole point is to get it to come from the bottom and go out the top but birds nests and crap get in there and they blow insulation in and i think the variables too john have to come into play you mentioned it you could have a finished attic with like my room and my and my brother's you know my my room my brother's room and then my sister's room and then, you know, chances are you may not have a bathroom up there. I still have to go downstairs if, you have, if it's finished. Or it's unfinished and it's 
it's just empty and they store Christmas stuff up there or it's loaded with crap or the I mean I think there's so many variations look you go into a bedroom you go to a family room it's furniture it's beds it's end tables stuff like that but you go up into an attic some people store everything up there some people convert it into a a workshop for like their arts and crafts. Some people have playrooms for little kids. That's the other thing. Little kids are up there. And sometimes in the older buildings, it's a smaller staircase. Right. Leading up to the attic. I mean, a small bathroom was a little, we had a little small bathroom on the second floor in my place out in the hallway, small hallway, little bathroom. The bathroom was a toilet and you, and your chin was practically on the sink. And that was it. A sink and a toilet with, you know, if you banged your head backwards, you, you'd hit the slope of the ceiling. I mean, it was nice to have a little, a little, a little ball up there. But the point is, another point is, it's not just finished or not finished. Sometimes, like you just mentioned, sometimes it's halfway. Sometimes there is a stairway, a full stairway, meaning it's a complete stairway. You don't have to pull it down, right? But it's unfinished. There's a nice doorway in the second floor hallway. You swing it open. Oh, this is where my little art studio is. This is where I do my reading or my writing. This is where the kids play. And all of a sudden you walk up this, the steps with no risers, just treads. You know, you get to the top, nice wooden floor. There's a, there's a window at the end. There's knee walls and there's like whatever it is, plywood or sheetrock on it. It's not really finished, but there's a floor there. And there's a couple of lights with the, with the string. You pull, up, you pull a string, you get lights on. So now you start crawling around up there. You think I'm good, but you still might not be good. Above your head might be all open joists and, and you might be, look right up to the ridge vent or right up to the ridge if it doesn't have a vent. So, geez, that's the, another problem. Like basements, attics, there's there's not one, there's not two, there's not three. There's probably five or ten variations on the style of construction right. and, and what's half. People put people go up there and put curtains. They put material up at the top. They they have extra old blankets or extra, and and they staple it up to the ceiling so you don't see the two by fours. You know, people don't know. I've got a picture right here in in our district in Wichita West, but where, where, where I volunteer. It's a nice, beautiful house and a nice cul-de-sac. I took pictures because the the unfinished, the attic, the doghouse dormers out the front with the windows. If you, if I stopped and I looked inside, halfway up inside the window, you, you can see plywood where they finished. You know, you if, if you were in there and you were jammed up, you couldn't even get to the window. I'm looking at a window, and two thirds of the way up it is plywood inside there where they. I mean. So you couldn't even get out if you wanted to. I mean, How about so you, get in? If you went in that window, would you just fall down to the first floor? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. You wouldn't in that one, but you'd fall into it's you know you where they're storing all the crap. But you know, it's the phoniness of this is again not getting out, not doing a three sixty, not looking up, not seeing okay, and not being fooled by the doghouse dormers that are just ornamental. They're just up there to make it look like there's a second floor or whatever. Some in that people have those not. ornamental doghouse dormers, and from inside you can look up and see them. And from outside, the light shines through them. It looks like a full second floor up there right. with lights on. And like I said, you pop that window. If you don't put a tool in there, you'll fall from there. You'll fall straight down 20, 25 feet, and you'll land on, on the entry mat in front of the front door because there is nothing there. It's just right. a dog house dormer to the, to the cathedral ceiling, you know? So let's, let's, let's talk about, I want to ask you about indications when you pull up, you know, 18th Battalion in the Bronx or... South Blooming Grove, it doesn't matter. You pull up. But if we talked about all the variables, all the causes, how it could run up, down, sideways, you know, from electrical problems to mulch problems to fireworks problems to, you know, balloon frame, all these different things, so on and so forth. Running up, you know, you know, vinyl insulation that's always burned down and getting into that Celotex and just dropping. And whether you have an attic that's lightweight constructed with gusset plates versus one with dimensional lumber, you know, all the different things that affect that. You turn the corner, you're in your BC's buggy, you're on your engine with Sal Blooming Grove. Indications for the young listener right now, all right, that would help him identify <laughs> that he's got it in the attic and not necessarily it's residual coming up from downstairs. What do you what are you what are you looking for as indicators that you got you got where are you telling your guys guys it looks like it's in the attic? Well, I, you know, smoke, smoke movement, and where the smoke is coming out, I think we mentioned that a little bit earlier is usually an indicator. See heavy smoke popping from up, you know, pushing out from around the windows. If there's a doghouse dormer or the windows on the gable ends, or maybe under the, under the shingles and the, along the edges of the peak, maybe even up at the peak a little bit. See what the fire come in as Did the fire come in as an attic fire. Most people that have a fire up in their attic, don't call in a fire for the second floor, you know, right. um, or the neighbor calls it in smoke coming from the house. Right. And they, 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 you know, sometimes the dispatcher can talk them into, 
not meaning he's talking to them into changing their mind about something, but he can ask enough questions that he'll, that he'll report. He'll, he'll give it to the fire department as smoke from the second floor. You know, right. I've heard them ask questions like that. Where's the, where's the smoke? Is the smoke coming out of the first floor or above the first floor? Oh no, not the first floor, the window, the window above the front door. So now the dispatcher sometimes makes a decision to say, Oh, that's the second floor. So now it's like engine one, engine one, ladder one, then report to a fire, one twenty three main street smoke from the second floor. Right. So now, now you're thinking second floor fire. You think you got a stairway. This place might not even have a second floor. It might be a, a one story ranch with cathedral ceilings and either those doghouse dormers or skylights or something. So, but smoke pushing out of not windows and openings, but out of all the other, con- the other seams and, and angles of the roof and, and things like that. Well, and you've got, you know, here's the thing we have, we have to remind our young firefighters and God bless them, the future of the fire service, the young men and women that are kicking ass for us now, not to get an old Tom Freeman phrase from Chicago, snookered, right? Don't get snookered because there's not much keeping fire out of the attic. Well, there's travel the walls on the outside, on the inside, but you look up at your ceiling and most, not all, most ceilings, I'm looking at a, a heat register. I'm looking at a vent right now that goes up into my attic. I, I can, I can, I mean, the first thing I feel when it blows out of there for the air conditioning, I feel the hot air from the attic first being put. There's, there's plenty of openings already for fire to travel. We talked before, we always get hooted about never trust a firewall because the plumbers get there, you know, the cable guys, they'll let you, they poke holes and fire can run left to right and all this. But we never really talk about all the void spaces that are right up in the damn ceiling, light fixtures and things that fire can travel and get up into an attic pretty quick, you know? So, so, okay. So you determine, you've determined that it's in the attic. We obviously know this is going to be a, 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 a hand line fire if you're going to make an interior a good attack and it's going to be your inch three quarter, maybe your two inch, but something versatile, something you can move around and everything else, especially flexible, with not so heavy line. Right. Yes, exactly. So I'll you, tell you another thing, other than a visual indicator, another indicator is your knowledge, you know, stuff that we've been talking about already. The fact that, you know, it's balloon frame, you know, that whole neighborhood is queen Anne's and queen Anne's a balloon frame or other than, other than queen Anne, but you know, yeah, these, these are balloon frame right here. You learn from the older guys. So now when you go in there, the fact that you got a balloon frame fire, just that piece of information, regardless of what the dispatcher says or what the report comes in as, the fact that you know that neighborhood has has balloon frame construction should make you at least consider that a little bit more quickly or a little bit more often, or if just for a moment while you're doing a 360 or while you're looking at it. Well, and you know, one of the things I've said before about always being suspicious is whenever you watch a video, and I've got plenty of the fires in Louisville. When, especially for a one story with a ranch with an attic above you, you know, when the guys walk through the front door, it's, it's, it's kind of almost, I want to say comical. They, every, everyone that walks through the front door looks up right away. They look up and, the, and I always ask why are they looking up? Because the crew that went in there first or the first truck guy threw a hook into the ceiling, right inside the door, pulled, pulled, not a little hole, pull, pull, pull. So you can see up in the attic. Cause if we're going to the right, to the kitchen or to the bedrooms, whichever where the fire is, Every time you go and you look up to make sure the fire's not running over your head and, and going to beat you back to the door or that way. And that's happened before. I've had guys, I've had guy. I had a guy go in and Tommy you sent one and turn around and went to me outside going, and he goes, boss, it's above us now. You know, it's running back above us. Well, if we're in such a, but I told somebody this earlier, John, today, my uncle retired from U.S. Gypsum in Chicago. He worked there like 40 years, big executive all through sales. And he, he used to tell me, you know, gypsum board is ruined at this temperature. When you have a fire, it's you can't paint it. You can't fit. It's ruined at this fire. Don't try and preserve it. That's right. Some guys you know, are worried about it. Don't pull ceilings. There's no fire. Who gives a shit? That, this all has to be ripped out and replaced. That's right. That's right. Pull the ceiling. So you get up there. So again, you know, what, what, what we're talking about that is getting up there and opening up right away. So now two things I've told my guys, and, and I actually just did this last week and we had a, we had a, we had a, I, I told you this, we had a rollover accident, the guys were on, and then we got a house fire. And, and I, I, I hate it. I hate it for the people, for the family. But this was one of them where the homeowner tried putting it out first with a guard hose, then he, on the oh, outside, then he went up in the attic. Yep, yep. Then he got another guard hose with the other end, then he decided to call us. We, it would have been a pumpkin fire. Yet we got there with fire through the roof. But so one of the things, and I know you've talked about this, I've taught my guys, especially a truck, I get in there. And the first thing you could do, how about using the roof line to your advantage? If you've got an attic fire and you want to get water up there as quickly as you can and kind of not get dispersed, 
you know, going in and pulling some ceiling right there, right? As soon as you get in the door or window, and then taking your host stream, your solid board nozzle, your straight stream, and directing that hole and using the roof line, using the roof line, you know, that line comes up and hits it, and that water goes pow, and it, and it goes in, you know, all different directions. You're, you're actually using the building construction, the pitch of the roof, as a helper, like you would a wall inside. To and I've told guys, those fires that burn up the outside and get into the eave and then burn up when, before you even stretch up there. When you get to the front door, open it up. You're going to knock the side of the house down if you can. And then go right along the eave real quick, back and forth. And you're going to do the same thing. It's going to yeah. be burnt open already. That's how the fire got up there. And at least a piece of that, a percentage of that water is going to get up there, get knocked out at an angle. And shoot up into the eave, you know, into, into the spaces between the joists up there as, a, as on the, the roof, you know. Yeah, the, the perfect. And you're not even in the building yet. And you're already having there's, an impact and you on might it. Be, and there's, there's an outside. There's hitting it outside <laughs> from the yard, right? Hey. And there's a legitimate reason for using a line from the outside. There you go. And, and this last fire, I, I drove the ladder truck, your old ladder truck. All right. I pulled up, I got out, and I grabbed my long hook. And as I'm walking up, you know, Ryan had just, our chief just backed him out real quick and, you know, reorganizing and go back in and hit this. We had a lot of fire. And I look at him, I go, you know what I'm going to do? And he gave me the thumbs up. You know, he knew because we've, we, you know, his, his strategy and all that. The only way it's going to go out if we start opening up really quick, get as much open up as quick and get water up there. So let me ask you this next. All right. Hold on. Before you ask oh, me another ahead. thing, I got another point you mentioned earlier that I didn't comment on was tools. Uh, you know, if you're going up for an attic fire, at least the team that's going up that way, including a hose line, you know what? Select your tools carefully. You know, an axe and a halogen, of course. And, and here we have, again, something contrary to what we normally say is like, what, you got a lot of fires in the closet? You got these closet hooks? Suddenly, here's a use for a closet hook. Don't go up there with a six-foot hook into a small attic. You're not going to be able to even move it around. You're not going to be able to pull any ceilings with it. There, there's a good good use for the attic hook is to get bring a couple of them small, short hooks up there with you. So if it is a finished attic, you can start pulling ceilings without – knocking everybody's teeth out or hitting people right. in, the, in the butt with, with your six foot hook. So select your tools carefully when you go up for an attic fire and make sure that they're small and manageable and they'll be effective up there instead of having to drop stuff on the top floor and climb up with maybe one tool. Once, once you get in the attic, exactly. But for those that are going to pull from below with eight foot ceilings or Obviously, a lot of houses, 10 foot ceilings. I was specific about people yeah, going into the attic. Exactly. Right? You're not going to get it, but those, because you know, I can't stand those things, but there is, you know, I guess there's a, you know, anyway. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I still don't like them, but, but, it, but anyway, so, all right. So we, we talked about size up, looking different ways to read it, how the fire could have got to the attic in the first place, all the different, there's, there's probably more, you know, we don't, we don't have three hours to talk about this, but we hit a lot of it. Talk a little bit about building construction, how that impacts it. We talked Hose about line, get a line up there quick. Get a line up there quick. We talked about knee walls. Get a line up there quick. If it's a balloon frame, get a second line or get someone up the attic right away. Now here's something I and and and, and <laughs> the debate over venting like a peak roof or not for a lot of residential fires. But the but I don't really think there's a debate when it comes to if you've got a fire in an attic. And you're going to try and get up in there. It, it it's going to want if there's no if there's like some of the really homes don't even have vents or whatever. If it's going to try come, I, I think the importance of getting a hole punched in the roof or doing something to give it somewhere to go, so you can get up there and get it is, is crucial. Otherwise, you know you're going to be you're going to, you know, take a beat on your head. And know that that could be the people that are on the inside. You got this steep roof on an old farmhouse or in a, or in a Queen Anne. You know what? Sometimes it's the two or three folks that are upstairs in the in the attic. Sometimes they can either pull the ceiling, or if there is no ceiling, it's unfinished. They can get up there and start pushing up with a halogen. Boom, boom. Especially the really old roofs that got those little strips, those little ridges, and then the, the tiles are all tucked under them. Right. They're not even any plywood or boards. One by force. One by force. You know, sometimes you can bank from any inside. The real old buildings, you can make a hole from the inside. And if not, you know what? That's why they make roof ladders. That's why they make power saws. Get somebody up there and you know, get up to the ridge, make make a nice big hole or as big as you can. Even if you make a triangle, at least it's going to start relieving that heat. This is where your ap apparatus placement for your area ladders, for your tower layers is important. If you can't get close enough, knowing how to work on top of roof, because this, I mean, again, there are times we talk about it. You're on the first floor and you got a two and a half story thing. You know what? Let's go get the fire. Let's be done with this. Leave the roof alone right now. Okay. If you, if you're, if it's down here and you're, you're trying to do this. But when you've got an attic fire, I just think getting that open, getting it, especially a decent fire. In fact, 
A another great example. We just did a show on why do we talk about Stockton, California, Wichita, Kansas so much, and, and I say Louisville, Texas. How many times have you seen them get on top of that roof? The guys are hit. They're going downstairs, and it is just chugging heat and smoke out the out the eaves and on the first floor. And you follow the roof guy up with his helmet cam, and people are like, oh, why is he up there? Or stuff. He's up there. He knows the roof. He knows the construction. He knows what he's doing. And bing, bang, zip, zip, boop, they open that hole, and golly. Now, to the inexperienced eye, like, oh, my God, look at all the fire. I'm like, no, that's what's supposed to happen. If if you punch a hole in the roof and, and, and a lot of smoke and fire don't come out of it, you're either not over the fire, you didn't open up, or somebody didn't put And sometimes with finished addicts, you may have to tell the guys, I can't, I'm hitting crap. Yeah. I mean, you guys got to pull it from down. You know, there's that yeah. communication. You've got to say, guys, Pull the ceiling. I can't get it from up on the roof because I'm, I'm no matter how long a hook I have. Like we used to carry, we still on, on, on your old ladder truck. We've got one really long hook just for those. If you've got to go up inside really high and do these big cathedral ceilings or coffered, or you're up there and you're trying to go, I've got all this crap. Maybe if I just reach down and, and actually use the roof and pushed, I could pop down sheetrock. At least I got something. But that mm -hmm. communication we always talk about, John, telling your interior, you know, second floor, or first floor, you want to attack from the roof. Guys, you got to pull some ceiling. We can't get the ceiling pushed down for you. So if you punch a hole in the roof and you don't get a good exhaust, whether it's heat, smoke, and or fire. Right. But if you, fire, fire. Yeah, if you get fired, don't, yeah, if you get fired, don't panic. That's what's supposed to happen. And getting up there to a peak roof. You should always be on a ladder if possible. Obviously, you got to be on a hook ladder unless it's a real, a real shallow ridge. You know, real shallow. Uh, you know, other than that, you should be on a roof ladder. And if you can reach, whether it's a tower ladder or an area ladder, if you can reach the the ridge, if you can get to the top of that peak with the with the mechanical ladder, and you can have somebody climb up and not even get off it. That's and right. Reach over and do a nice big triangular hole or, have, or whatever the hole they've been trained to make. That's the way to go. The building could fall down to the, into the basement and you still be up on that ladder. John, we had, Louisville still has as a prop where you can work from a bucket. You can work from other buckets on a roof at the training field. How to cut from, 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 from that, you know, to, right. be able, to be able to get that maybe done. Yeah. Light belt on, maybe one foot on the roof and one foot on the bucket, you know, and you're attached with a belt. If something was to let go, boom, you're not going to fall in. Somebody well, can pull you right and back And the quickness, up. not to turn this, we already talked about ventilation before, but Knowing your, knowing your roof construction. Now, for me, it was easy because I was a roofer. I, I, I did it for years and years and years. My old man, I mean, I could, I could, on the way up, I always had the ability to push up on the shingles at the gutter edge. And some guys go, there's four roofs. I go, no, there's two roofs. That's the rain. That's the, you know, that's the, you know, that there's only two. Anyway, get into the whole, how they do that later and everything else with protecting the, the, everything. That being said, some of the older homes, some of the older, older homes that started, like you said, with the one by fours, and they had, and they used to put about a two inch gap in between them, two to three inch gap to allow the wood shakes to breathe back in the old days. And they were real thin wood shakes. And then they came back and they just roofed over it. And then instead of drop roll roofing and you'll have three, I used to pull four and five roofs off of a roof in, uh, in Chicago, the Chicago area, you know, and then we would, we would actually deck over it with plywood, screw it up, you know, screw the corners down, deck cut it. So it will all be flash because Dimensional lumber back then is not the same as today. You put one by two strips in those holes and you end up with this ripple thing. But knowing the roof construction, here's the thing. I've seen guys address attic fires, John, Fenley, by popping the little tin vents off. First of all, that hole's about the size of a Frisbee, if that. It's, it's, about, it's about that big around that you cut, if they even did it. There's the people just put the vents sometimes, there's no holes. They just they just put them up there and nail them. The roofers are cheating. Or they don't cut back all the, the, the shingle around there. So you got so if anything, if you're gonna pop one of those vents, I used to tell guys, pop the vent off, use that as your use that as your inspection hole and use it as your starter. You can pop it off, turn your pick and X, pow, pow, pow. You can pull planks, decking, plywood. What's usually at the top of a roof, John? Well, if, if it's plywood, it's four by eight sheets under side, four foot, four foot, four foot, and they get to the top almost always, not always, almost always there's about two feet left up there. So they have to cut plywood in hand. So you only have a strip up there a lot of times. So you get where those holes are, boom, you can pull up. You can do this. Eddie Enright is called a zipper cut. Or if you've got those, those ridge vents, there you go. You pull the ridge vents off and you can reach down. You can pull whole sheets of plywood off. It, 
if you get along the rafter, don't do it in the center where it bounces. Get rid of it. Pop at, uh, with a popping motion. Pop the nails and give the relief to the guys inside because now they're trying to get up to that tiny attic hatch or that tiny set of stairs, and there's fire up there that has nowhere to go. But and and you've got a roof that's actually directed; it's going up and pushing it down. It, yeah, you know. So venting the roof is huge here, but knowing how, like you said, working from a roof ladder, knowing how to get. How about the roof ladders we talked about? You saw in Wichita it has the hooks on both ends. A lot of guys have that now. Hooks and butts. Hopes all and four butts. ends of both both beam both ends of both beams have a, have a butt on them, so you so can, can dig into the ground. And both ends of the ladders have hooks. Yeah, so it's 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 flippable up at the top instead of whipping it around. Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, here's one thing we didn't talk about that I think we need to mention. You and I talk about in our tactics classes when we do the firehouse scenarios or first two officer that is the, is just to discuss briefly here the widow makers in the attics. And you know you take you say widow maker to a lot of young firefighters nowadays. And God bless them. They think you're talking heart attack, you know, all the Widowmaker here. I, I'm talking about the Widowmaker of the chimney that collapses and kills firefighters you don't know is coming. And, and I've got some great pictures in class, John, if you remember, uh, especially on the Cape Cods or those roofs that they haven't they haven't yet put the, 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 uh, the shed dormers on. And you have that old chimney that comes through into the attic, finished or unfinished, doesn't matter. It comes through and then it takes a 45 degree angle and then drops down above where the furnace is or the boiler or the, the hot water heat and all that stuff. Well, where that 45, you know, we've talked about it, where that 45 degree angle is, the, the, the construction people put a little square, they're two by fours. It's, a, it's two by fours and a square underneath that 45 to not, not but hold it. But I mean, I mean, I've got like 30 pictures of these things all the years I was roofing. I'm like, get my camera, get my camera. And, and so you've got now that's all fine and dandy, just like, you know, lightweight construction and glued and all that stuff and, and laminates are strong until you introduce them to fire. Now you put a fire in that attic and you burn away that support. You've got all that, all those bricks, the weight to that, 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 that mortar sitting on top of it. And when it lets loose, it comes through the floor, through the wall. You could be downstairs and that thing will go pow. Or outside and 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 folks to the to our newer firefighters, that's why they call them widow makers, because they make a they make a widow out of a firefighter's spouse because boom, it comes down and it gets you. All you know? chimneys, all chimneys are dangerous at every fire, regardless of whether they're held up by wood or pieces or straight or crooked or old or new. Uh, Mark McLeese lost a guy up in Syracuse, New York, a couple of years ago. A fire investigator the day after the fire. The day after the fire, the next morning, he responded in, went upstairs with a couple other guys. They called the company down there, you know, to help open up a little bit. And they were up in the attic and the chimney let go and killed the fire investigator 24 hours after the fire. And, Amazing. And, There's and no you, such thing as a safe chimney. No. And you're now going to outrun bricks usually, you know, and if, if you're across the street. Cool. Yeah. So, so just, I wanted to mention that briefly about the widow makers. And so our, to our listeners, if you're ever in a building, do an overhaul or in your own house, take a look and you might very well be surprised. You see this where that, that brick chimney comes down. If it makes that 45, see what's holding it up. See what's holding up that whole elbow of, of bricks before it drops down. You might be surprised. So John, last I've seen some departments depends on the owner, depends on the insurance, depends on a lot of things. I've seen some fire departments with heavily, heavily damaged building. It's going to be knocked down or, or is burned down. Actually pull the chimney down before they leave. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Well, you know, and Steve, Stephen Wright is one of my favorite comics. You know, he's the guy that talks like this. It says, I, I spilled spot remover on my dog. Now he's gone. He's all that kind of stuff. He's the one that said, you ever notice after a fire, the only thing stands the fireplace? Kind of ironic, huh? And it's as he much as he jokes about it. Yeah, it's serious, but it's standing there and there ain't, I mean, there ain't much to it. So yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I don't blame you when it comes to that. So, all right. So John, we talked about with the attic fires, the aggressiveness of getting a line getting water into the attic, whether you start outside to start direct, like you said, and hitting the eaves and pushing it up there and get, you know, giving yourself a little help, finding access. This is where that good six or eight foot hook, when you're on that way, when you're looking up at the attic, whatever floor you're on, to be able to reach up without having to reach over your head, to be able to reach up and start pulling and get up ahead of the nozzle and get up again ahead of him or her right at the top and start yanking ceiling down and get it open so they can start directing water up into that attic as quick, quickly as possible. 
I know some guys that focus so much on trying to get that little staircase by the time they actually make their way and get up there. Right. I think get it pulled, get it pulled, get water up there as quick as you can. Then somebody say, okay, Rick, I got the stairs over here. Right. Then go up there. Okay. Water, water from the second floor hallway into the attic above the two above the second floor is as effective as water from the top of that stairway. After you climb up that rickety little crappy fold down stairway, you put two guys in full gear on that. Number one, I don't know if they could fit. Number two, the damn thing may just fall down and fall right. out of the ceiling. So don't hesitate. Again, it's all about time. We want to get there quick. We want to get the lineup there quick. And then they waste four minutes trying to pull down the fold down stairs and figure out how to get up. As soon as you get up there, even if you walk past the fall down stair, pull some ceiling, get a couple of nice big garbage can size openings, right? Garbage can cover size openings. Right. And get throw some water up there. And now you got the you, you take the you take the muscle out of it. You know, That's now it's it. not roaring. Yeah. That's it. Reach up, pull the that last fire hat. I reached up, I pulled ceiling right away. I pulled it in several different spots. And I got the sheetrock down. The first thing that fell was all the blown in insulation. Then they came back with rolled insulation over that. If you're not paying attention and you're not reaching up. You're going to pull down. I think you dropped it. You see the the, the blown insulation fall, and not realize you have rolls still up there that you can't see because of the smoke. So yeah. reaching up, it's like it's like reaching through a window and pulling the curtains out after you vent a window. Reaching up, make sure you pull that. So getting up there, don't forget, folks. Use the roof line to your advantage to direct your stream. Let's let's say you pull up. You've got so much fire that your 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 chief is saying, "No, nah, no, nah, we're not going. Let's. Let, I want to hit this a little bit first before we make entry." You go, okay, boss. So what you do, you stand at that, you go right inside that door, stand at that door, through that window, long hook, pull some ceiling, use the roof line to direct that water, deflect that water, like John said, from the outside, use that in the inside to give you a little, a little buffer, give you a little, all right, you know, throw some water up there. It'll hit that, that underside of that decking and, and blow in different directions. The last thing, John, I want to address is the need for I'll say strong overhaul. When you're done, like I, we start off the show saying, like, I love basement fires in the way of the challenge. I think the challenge is there. When I said I don't like attic fires, because the pain in the ass when the fire's out, oh my God, because you got, first of all, you have a bunch of crap up there that yeah. if, if unlike a room, you could pitch it out a window. If you don't have a window and they start, that means that stuff's got to come out somewhere. Think about that. And now I've got some great pictures in Chicago on the inside. All of a sudden, here they come with their halogens. They're busting the roof up from the inside, and that's how they were taking everything out. Because otherwise, how do you take all this burnt not a bad stuff? Idea. Yeah. Plus, if there's not good flooring up there, sometimes there's just a couple little paths, little planks to walk on. So now there's unsure footing. When there's unsure footing, nobody really wants to spend a lot of time and walk around and be all of a sudden you're stepping through the joists and stuff. So it is difficult. You could end up spending more time overhauling than fighting the fire exactly exactly and i i, I remember you know i've done that before I, but I've, I've just seen that what a great just pop it all of a sudden you saw the roof coming up and then a hook and then a, a halogen and then big 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 before you know it they cut and now because where do you uh, talk about where do you bring everything you got all this stuff that burned up there you're going to drag it through the whole second and first or first all floor of the, of the house. Real nice. You yeah, know, or so hold at the gable end, if you can. Yeah, exactly. Even so no now you know. get, exactly. Now you get to that part, John, you're the chief. You're standing out front going, I know we're going to be back here. Ryan and I were just talking about chief of Wichita West. We were just talking about because we're both, we're both nervous ninnies when it comes out. Like, I hate going back at two in the morning, even for just a little bit of fire, because it just doesn't make us look good, you know? And but you've got all the blown in insulation. You have stuff that your line blew. You have stuff that your your stream. You got crap that got down into the eaves, and then a thermal imager. A tick is great, but a tick is not foolproof. Number one, number two, piles of stuff that was smolder and is wet is going to you, the stuff in the middle is still burning, and your yeah, thermal and the cold, imager won't. Cold wet stuff is shielding the tick yeah. from it, or maybe even you from seeing it or seeing smoke. Yeah, this is where good strong. You know, thoughtful, you know, deliberate overhaul when it comes to an attic is the way to go. Now, and lastly, if if that's the case, it was an attic fire. You know, folks, don't forget there. You know, the, the the fire tetrahedron is fuel, heat, oxygen, chemical chain reaction. There's a couple more sides of that thing that we don't talk about. And that's salvage and overhaul. Those are people's ashes. Those are people's pictures. Those are people's belongings. If you have an attic fire and you don't have nothing below it before you. I, John, I remember our guys, they're they're in there, they got a line on, and guys were already moving moving stuff, put on a bed and give me a cover, throw it in here. And while these guys were pulling ceiling here, they're moving everything 
all the pictures people never be able to replace, all the, the, the urn with the ashes, all those 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 collectibles that you, what we taught rookies in, in the probies in, in the academy, throw it all in the bed, throw a cover up, and then come back. At least and you know what the cover is? You run in the bathroom, you rip the shower curtain down. A lot of time there's an inside and an outside. You got two big shower curtains, you just pull it right off the pole, and now you can put a bunch of stuff on a bed or a top of the dresser, and you put a shower curtain over it, a bunch of stuff on a mattress, pictures, valuables, tool you know, toolboxes, jewelry boxes. And cover it with a shower curtain. Even though they're going to have to dig through it maybe after the fire, they might say, oh, my God, look, we saved the pictures of mom and dad or whatever. You know? That aren't digitized. That aren't exactly. So, you know, it's for a lot of firefighters, John, you know this, it's not the most exciting part of fighting a fire. But it's absolutely necessary if you believe in taking care of the families that you said you could protect. Oh, Take oh, care of oh, oh, their, yeah. their stuff, their belongings, their things. So if, it's, if you know you've got an attic fire and nothing below, do what you can't, man. I, I mean, I know, I know, guys. That John, I, I can see it. I can, I know the crews. These guys are pulling the ceiling and directing the line. And there's two guys over here. As they're doing, it, they're piling all the stuff in the bed. They're taking pictures off. They're doing everything. Oh, don't hesitate to send a crew in the floor below. You know, say, yeah, hey, you guys are doing nothing. You know what? This fire's knocked down. Get inside. Get to get to the second floor, please. Try and salvage as much stuff as you can. Use the even if you give them direction, throw stuff on the bed and put the shower curtain over it. Just save as much as you There's can. There's guys that don't even know where their own salvage covers are, or they or they carry one on the rig. We've got a salvage cover on the rig. Really? When's the last time you used just one salvage cover at a decent fire? You come in, you throw. I mean, look at what look at the old days. Before when Ben, everybody confuses 1736 when Ben Franklin created the first volunteer fire department, they weren't volunteer firefighters, they were service patrolmen. And and they would they would they would put fires out. They would respond with hooks and ladders and catch alls and carry alls and tarps, and they would save as much as they can of the belongings out into the street or covered up. And then the insurance guy would come pay them in silver and gold. They didn't throw water on fire. In fact, they started throwing water on fires with those felt caps, not to put it out. It was to save more stuff. They got more money. So we've been saving people's personal property, putting out the fire, and and knowing that the smoke and the heat does more damage than the fire than other byproducts. Protecting their belongings is a big part of what we do when it comes to fighting fires that I think we forget about. So I just want to mention that. Yep. Yep. All right. Well, anything else? Attic fires. Anything else, buddy? I, I mean, I got three days worth of stuff, but I think we gave a good, <laughs> a good synopsis, right? I think we did a great job. And and, and to Tim, uh, and again, Tim, I'm sorry. I sorry. I think it's it's either Gravius or Gravius. Uh, thanks yeah, for the thanks message. For the suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, and guys, we get we get a lot of suggestions. Sometimes we can't do them uh, for whatever, or we can't do them right away. Sometimes we we just did it three months ago or whatever. It's like writing an article for the magazine; they're not going to publish it if they just did an article on it like two months ago. But we do our best to give. This was a good one, Tim. Thank you because we've addressed it bits and pieces before, but not where we've dedicated a whole show to attic fires. So, um, John, best way for them to get a hold of you, buddy, Chief John Salta at gmail.com and i'm chief lasky at gmail.com we both have our great websites john salka.com chief lasky.com uh check those out as well again if you're looking to host any of our programs um you know have us out or whatever just for a bit whatever just give us a shout and we'll do our best to get get back to you um you can always catch like i said some great some great podcasts right here at fireengineering.com uh, this one being the command post, John, we've been doing this for years and years, this particular show, uh, and, and a lot of great feedback. We're honored to do it. Nobody gets paid for these things. We don't have smile, that stuff. You see other people begging for money. We like doing it because we love the fire service and, and, and we love it. John, you said it. I said it in, in Maine at a great time in, in, with the Oxford Fire Rescue in Maine. I said, me and my buddy John say it all the time. We have the honor of hanging with the coolest people in the world. We get to go to dinner. We get to hang with them, teach to the coolest people in the world, the, the firefighters. So thank you, folks, for what you do. In closing, we always ask you to please keep the men and women, our forces, your thoughts and prayers. Remember, never forgetting means just that, never forgetting. Be safe and God bless you.